So tonight, uh, by the way, I'm Tom Zinnan. Thanks for coming. I work here at the Biotech Center. I also work for uh, the Division of Extension and Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks, thanks again for coming tonight. Uh, tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Matthew Brown. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery with the Division of Transplantation. Uh, he was born in Appleton, went to school at Appleton West High School, came here to UW-Madison and got his undergraduate degree in molecular biology, stayed at UW-Madison and got his PhD in cellular and molecular pathology, then he did a postdoc across the street at the Morgridge Institute for Research in Jamie Thompson's lab, and then he started his faculty position here in January of 2019, January of this year. He also said, I spent a couple of years in Chicago. <laughs> but So what were the years in Chicago about? Uh, I've worked as a lab manager at the University of Chicago. No Bears affiliation at all. <laughs> oh, we're not worried about the Bears. Um, where did you live? Um, Ukrainian village in, Ch wow. in the city. I don't know the city real well anymore. My brother and sister used to live there 25 years ago, and now it's all a mystery. So I hope you had a good time. Tonight he's going to talk about one of the cooler things ever, induced pluripotent stem cell therapies, this whole idea of humanized mice, and the future of transplantation. It's a pretty cool thing to think about. Um, this is a lectern that Jamie Thompson announced to the world on November 6th of 1998, that he had figured out how to grow human embryonic stem cells. At that time, he said, it's going to take a long time before anything comes out of this besides research. That was nearly 21 years ago, and I think things are starting to come to fruition. So it's going to be very interesting to see what you have to say today. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Brown to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Well, thank you. Can you all hear me, or should I? Everyone's okay. Um, thanks for having me, and thanks for coming out tonight. It's great to have an audience that's interested in a diverse um, uh, bunch of science here. Um, so just a, an outline, I'll talk a little bit about transplantation, the past and the future, um, induced pluripotent stem cells, a um, little bit about T cells, the thymus, and flow cytometry, which is an assay that immunologists use a lot of, uh, use, use quite frequently. Um, and that'll be a, a, I guess it's not a pop quiz if I announce it in advance, but it'll be a, a little quiz. Um, then I'll talk, uh, where my, my lab's research program gets involved is uh, IPSC immunogenicity, so the immune response to therapies made from IPS cells. Um, and then humanized mice, which is, um, human, humanized mice are a tool to study the in vivo immune response to these therapies. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people have a biology background in the, in the room? Okay, so good, good amount. Um, I wasn't quite sure how to prepare the talk, but I, hopefully I give enough depth, but also an overview of, of the research. Um, I will mention briefly there's a, a little bit of um, politics and science that gets interjected when you're talking about humanized mice. I, I won't delve too much into it, but I'll, I'll touch upon that because um, humanized mice, um, the BLT mouse that I'll talk about, um, does rely on human uh, fetal tissue, so there's some controversial aspects to that that I'll, I'll just mention. Um, so transplantation immunology, this is a quote from Alexis Carell, who won the Nobel Prize in 1912, um, and his work involved the vascular anastomosis, basically joining two blood vessels together. Um, before that technique was perfected, um, organ transplantation was just a, a dream, not possible, um, and th this technique enabled all sorts of surgical advances, and um, he won the Nobel Prize for perfecting that in 1912. In his acceptance speech, he, I won't read the, the whole quote, but the gist of it is, now we have the, the surgical, from the surgical point of view, we have, have these techniques that are advanced, now it's going to um, be the fundamental study of biological relationships between living tissues 
um, that will become more important in the future. And basically, he's talking about immunology, which back then there was a very limited understanding. Um, I don't even think they knew about T cells back then. Um, there was a very rudimentary understanding of antibodies and, and other um, parts of the immune system. So even back then, in his early experiments with transplanting organs between dogs and, and animals, um, he knew that these, these organs could be, even if they were put in correctly from a surgic, surgical standpoint, they could be quickly rejected, and we had to understand the biology behind that. I'll also refer you to a book by my colleague Josh Mesrich, in the Department of Surgery, um, he's a transplant surgeon and wrote a book. He, he um, tells some stories about his experience as a modern-day transplant surgeon, but also touches upon um, uh, colorful characters from history like Alexis Carell, who was actually um, a very controversial figure in his time. Um, so I'll leave it at that. So traditional organ transplantation, just an over overview of taking out a patient's diseased heart or other organ and having a donor, either from a, a cadaver or in the case of uh, kidney transplantation and um, sometimes with livers also, you can do a living donor transplant. So taking out the diseased organ and putting in a more functional, healthy organ. The next generation that um, we're going to in the future involves um, xenotransplantation, growing organs in, in pigs or other animals and then transplanting into humans. Um, and then there's pluripotent stem cells, and I'll, I'll talk more about those, but um, Jamie Thompson in 1998 was the first person to derive human embryonic stem cells, which um, ushered in this new era of um, thinking about personalized or um, replacement cell therapy, where you could take an embryonic stem cell and in, in a dish differentiate it into a neuron, into a, a cardiomyocyte or other cell type in the body. Um, pluripotent stem cells refers to both embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotent stem cells, which I'll, I'll talk about next. And one technique that um, people are working on, are actually growing human um, pluripotent stem cell derived organs in animals and then transplanting into humans. I won't get into that research, but this is all, um, both of these areas are actively being worked on, as well as working on um, improving traditional organ transplants. So, induced pluripotent stem cells, um, this, this discovery was made in 2006 in mice and then 2007 um, simultaneously with Dr. Thompson and Dr. Shinya Yamanaka in Japan, um, whereby you take a, a skin fibroblast from a, from a patient, um, and later on we've done it with, with blood cells and other cell types, but the gist is you take a, a, a terminally differentiated cell type, like a skin cell, fibroblast, and you genetically engineer, you insert um, four to six transcription factors that are associated with pluripotency, the, this property of um, being able to turn into other tissues in the body. You force the, the skin fibroblast or the blood cell to turn into an embryonic stem cell-like cell. And this is iPS cells, and they, they, they look like that. That's actually an, a colony of iPS cells, um, a couple hundred cells growing in a cluster. So it goes from either a skin cell to, or a blood cell to those, those colonies. And then what you can do is you can scale those up. Um, you can grow billions and billions of them and then differentiate them with different growth factors and other conditions in a dish and turn them into um, all the cell types of the body except for the placenta. So tremendously powerful advance. Um, actually, Dr. Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for this discovery. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Thompson was not included, and we, some of us feel like he was, he was robbed um, to be not included on that uh, Nobel Prize. But um, the promise of iPS cells is you have that power to, to grow up a virtually unlimited supply of these, this starting material and then make huge quantities of these replacement cells that could be used therapeutically. And since they come from an individual patient, um, you or I could go have our own iPS cells made and um, then get a cell therapy transplanted back into our own body. And in theory, we wouldn't need to take the same dose or pot potentially any of the immunosuppressive drugs that traditional organ transplant patients have to take, which have a lot of side effects, um, 
make you more prone to viral infection and some cancers. So tremendously pro promising. Um, but what we have to do to get these to the clinic and to get these therapies validated is one, make functional cell types from iPS cells. Um, and then we need to gauge whether or not the immune system will tolerate or reject um, the cells. Um, so these, I, I view these as the two key hurdles from going from this discovery to the clinic. Um, there's a lot of different um, parts and different scientists play different um, roles in this, in this, um, this path here, um, from basic science discoveries to um, optimizing and developing differentiation protocols to actually make a beating heart cell that um, has the elect electrophysiology of, a, of an adult um, cardiomyocyte. Um, so there's a lot of work being done on all different steps of this process. And then once things get optimized where you have a truly functional cell that looks promising, there's a whole host of um, you know, clinical trials and, and developing things to prepare for the clinic. So my research focuses on this immunogenicity aspect of if we can make a, a cell type that is promising, can we make it be tolerated by the patients? Even a functionally perfect cell therapy could be swiftly rejected in a matter of minutes by, by a patient. So there's a lot of different players in the, the immune system. Um, and I'm focusing more on the adaptive immune system and in particular on T cells. That's the area of, that I, I research. Um, you may be familiar with T cells. The CD4 T cells are the, the primary cell type that HIV um, infects and um, depletes and, and causes the symptoms associated with AIDS. Um, but T cells are, are one of the major players of the cell mediated immune response to. Um, to viruses, um, to um, self-antigens, and also to transplanted tissues. So really, um, focusing on the T-cell mediated response will help us understand how, how the body um, interacts with these cells. Um, it can get really complicated. There's a lot of different um, subsets of T-cells that have different profiles of the, the transcription factors that um, regulate gene expression and um, uh, the, the cytokines that they produce and the, the roles in the body. Some are involved with allergy and parasite responses and some um, have roles in, in um, autoimmunity. Um, I won't really get into many details about the different types of, of CD4 T cells that we're looking at, but in general, the T cell recognizes its target, either an antigen presenting cell that has taken up um, uh, fragments of, of, of cells or, or virus that have entered the body and it, um, through, this, through this interaction with these um, cell surface um, receptors and ligands, the T cell will um, interrogate the, the um, antigen presenting cell or the tissue itself in the case of a, of a transplanted organ. So we can, um, we can characterize T cells by the different types of, of, of molecules that are on the surface as well as um, what's being expressed inside the cell. Um, a, a key um, part of a T cell is a T cell receptor which recognizes a, a peptide antigen presented on um, a major histocompatibility complex of an antigen presenting cell. Um, most all of your cells in your body have this um, MHC class one that expresses um, uh, antigens in the T cells, look at that as a uh, lock and key and decide whether that's self and to tolerate that or if it's um, you know, a virus infected cell and um, targeting that cell for, for elimination. So I also wanna mention where T cells are made. Um, the thymus is an organ that rests um, basically covering your heart um, and your, your sternum. And at birth, it's quite large, and it, it peaks in size at uh, puberty, and then it gradually atrophies um, as, as you get older. Um, and there's, even in elderly people, you can still find um, areas of, of functional thymus, but for the most part, as, as you get older, it atrophies, and you get less, um, less T-cell production. But this is the site where, where your T-cells are made, and where they learn to recognize self from non-self. Um, 
about 98% of the, the developing T cells in the thymus um, are targeted by apoptosis and they die. The remaining approximately 2% go out and they protect you from uh, viral invasion or viral infection and um, they can also mediate a response to organ transplants. So the thymus is, is crucial for um, development of the T cells. I'll talk really briefly about the uh, flow cytometry, which is a, a key tool that immunologists use and a lot of other scientists use to um, study cell profiles. And the gist is you, if you have a mixture of cells and you want to know what the composition of that, that cell um, type is, you, you can label the cells, put them into the flow cytometer, that's this, this machine on the left here, and out comes the the data that will, will give you um, a picture of what's inside of, of your tube, all the different cell types. But whenever I have um, students in the lab, we, we have a lot of equipment like this and machines that are very complicated and becoming easier to use. And I always I think it's important to talk at least a little bit about the, the science behind um, what this is. Um, rather than just say you, you put your sample in the machine and out comes this data. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of a background in flow cytometry. So if we have this mixture of cells, if you have these antigen-presenting cells or um, different immune cells and T cells, they each have the distinct profile. And let's say we want to determine how many CD8-positive um, T cells there are in a cell mixture. You can take an antibody, which um, is then labeled uh, covalently bound to a, to a fluorophore, a, fl a fluorescent molecule. And you can get a, a host of different antibodies that are specific for, um, for very specific epitopes. And you can get a, a CD8-specific antibody. You mix it with your cells, the, the, the antibody will bind. Um, it's a very crude diagram. It's not how it actually looks. But antibody will bind to the target, and then it, the cell is, is labeled with that particular fluorescent dye. And what you can do is you can label, you can have CD8 antibodies, CD4, all these different um, types of uh, markers that are associated with, with cell types of interest and use different colors on the fluorochrome. And um, so I think the flow cytometers now, some of them you can do up to 30 or more colors, so different markers in one sample. Um, but the, the, the principle is there's a fluidic system where all of your labeled cells are, go um, through this, um, uh, this one by one through this stream and the laser will, will hit each individual cell. The, the specific fluorochromes that are on those antibodies bound to your cells will be excited and emit light at a very specific um, wavelength and then these detectors can tell what what light is being emitted by that particular cell at that moment in time. So then out comes your, your data, and each one of these, so um, you know, CD3 is a, is a T cell marker, and CD19 is a B cell marker, and um, the, it makes these dot plots. First you get an idea of the, of the size, crudely, um, of, of the cells. So you have your smaller lymphocytes, they tend to be um, the lower end of, of this plot and then larger granulocytes, neutrophils and other cell types are larger and they, they appear up here. You can, each one of these dots represents one cell. And you can um, draw these gates around there and then put them into these subplots and say of these lymphocytes what percentages are CD19 B cells, what percent are CD3 T cells and then draw your gate around those and look at CD4s versus CD8s and so on and so forth. So you get a really clear idea of what types of cells you're, you're working with. So back to IPS cells. Um, before I go too much into it, I'll do my little pop quiz here. So this is a, my crude representation of a surgical field. And there you have this, this um, biological specimen there. So this is a close-up of a human heart a mouse heart, chipmunk heart, <laughs> bioengineered heart, or none of the above. And I'll give you a little, oh, oh, I think I told the answer. Um, so let me just add a little motion. So, so you can, um, 
can see the contractions there. Um, I'll let you hold your answers in your, in your heads, but what this is actually is um, started out with these induced pluripotent stem cells from a human, turned them into cardiomyocytes with the help of our collaborators, Tim Camp in the Department of Medicine and um, some collaborators at the University of Alabama. They have a really good differentiation protocol to make, and I don't have a video of these, but each one of these little spheroids, um, this is the actual size, this is a, my fingers, they're holding up a tissue culture dish, and these little dots are these spheroids, and each one is contracting at the same rate and with the same electrophysiological properties as your own human cardiomyocytes. So we took those, and this is a, an immunocompromised mouse, and this is its kidney. And you transplant in these little spheroids, we put five, five to eight of those spheroids under the kidney capsule, um, and that's, it's just a, it's a good place to transplant in tissue because there's a great blood supply there so the tissue will survive and thrive. And um, so the answer is it's a mix of some of those things I said. Um, here's the, with the mask removed, I'll show you the video again. But so this is the mouse um, skin that's been it's opened up and this, this is the mouse kidney. And then just this portion here that's contracting is the um, human cardiomyocyte graft. And you can see those blood vessels, that's all neovasculature that has developed over the course of 30 days in the animal. So you can imagine that this would be a potential therapy to be transplanted into the human heart to impair, repair a, um, an infarct or other um, heart pathology. So that's, we're, we're working on um, this as a cell therapy with our collaborators. So let's get into a little bit of immunogenicity, and this is kind of an overview of, to, to illustrate this, this concept a little more. So what we're trying to do is with, with cardiomyocytes, and um, our lab is also working with endothelial cells that are the cells that are lining the inside of um, arteries and other blood vessels, we want to re reproduce what happens naturally in the, the human body. We want to reproduce nature and the, the perfect almost perfect machine that is the human. Um, so we're trying to replicate that, and our tool is pluripotent stem cells, either embryonic stem cells or iPS cells. And our, our differentiation protocol is the recipe to turn that into either, you know, like I said, a, a cardiomyocyte, a heart cell like I just showed you, or um, these endothelial cells in the inside of the um, blood vessels for a therapy. And I like to use analogies um, to, to illustrate these concepts. So we have, um, what we're trying to replicate is, is a composer thinking of uh, this piece he, hears, he or she hears in, in their head. And the tool is the instrument, and the sheet music is like the um, protocol to um, try and recreate as audible music. And I have a representative example here. Uh, with no sound. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, my, that's my son um, performing that piece. And that, that kind of represents, you know, the, maybe where we're at as a field of, of making uh, cell therapies. It represents what Ludwig von Beethoven had in his mind, but it might be a little crude. Um, and here's, you know, another version. represents the body as a, as a symphony of um, uh, coming very close to what, what the composer had in mind, I think. So tolerance, what we're trying to encourage would be a standing ovation of the performance. <laughs> and rejection would be the crowd <laughs> charging the stage and um, uh, you know, hurting the orchestra. So um, this is what we're trying to study. We want to encourage tolerance and find ways to prevent rejection of these cell therapies. And hopefully the, the lessons we learn can also inform what we do for traditional organ transplants as well. <laughs> um, so where are we from when, when Jamie Thompson was at this, this podium um, in the promise of, of these therapies? Um, a lot has happened in, in over 20 years now since um, human ESLs were, were first um, derived. 
Um, there's a series of uh, phase one clinical trials that are in progress. Most of them do use embryonic stem cells, and we're just starting to have the first IPS um, clinical trials. So phase one, just safety um, at this point. The very first wave is there, there's some for um, central nervous system, um, for paralysis, um, retinal pigment, epithelial cells for macular degeneration, and then encapsulating um, pancreatic islet-like cells to protect them from the immune system. So that this very first wave of these, these um, clinical trials tend to be in immune privileged sites where the immune system is less of a concern. Um, the second wave that's in about to start happening in the coming years, we'll get more into um, immune competent sites of the you know, heart, blood vessels, liver, areas where there'll be an intimate um, connection with the immune system. So we really need to understand that immune response to these therapies. And um, like I said, even the most promising um, cell therapy that works wonderful in, in the lab could be swiftly rejected unless we can blunt the immune response, especially in these immune competent sites. So. Two things just to consider, um, I won't really go much into this, is both the transplant site that the cells go into, their exposure to, to um, immune cells, and then inherent immunogenicity of the cell types themselves. And these are, these are things that we're, we're studying in the lab. There are a lot of tools to, to assess the immune response to, to pluripotent stem cell therapies. What we like to, what we're trying to do is have both in vitro assays as well as in vivo assays and um, you know, paint a, a full picture of what the immune response will be. So there's, I won't really go into too many details about the specific assays that we can do in a dish. Um, in vivo, we have the, the gold standard would be a, a randomized uh, controlled clinical trial, but until we can get to that point, we'll use animal models like the mouse and the pig or non-human primates. We also have humanized mouse models, and that's, uh, Pulled that from the internet. I, I just have the website as the source, but I, I, I like that drawing. It kind of illustrates the concept. Um, and what this is, is uh, there's some different definitions, but how I'll, I'll define it here is a, a mouse that has no immune system of its own, and we introduce uh, human immune cells into the mouse. The first iteration of these was called the BLT mouse, and that used... Um, CD34 hematopoietic stem cells from uh, human fetal liver tissue injected intravenous into a, a NSG mouse, which is an immune compromised mouse strain that has to be irradiated in order to get engraftment of the cells. And then the human thymus tissue where the T cells are made is surgically transplanted under the kidney capsule, like I, I showed you for that cardiomyocyte. And the the cells find their way to the thymus fragments, and human T cells and other immune cells develop within the mouse. So after about 8 to 12 weeks after you perform this procedure of introducing the, the human cells and tissue, you get a, uh, a mouse that has in its circulation and its tissues human um, immune cells. And that's, um, it's, it's a very useful model to, to look at the in vivo immune response. You can transplant tissue into these mice, you can infect them with HIV and other um, human trophic viruses that um, you couldn't study in just a traditional mouse model. So, so they're very powerful for certain questions, and in particular, T cell, uh, human T cell mediated immune responses are. This is a this is a good model for for studying this. And what we could do for iPS cells is we, we want to we test that concept of what will happen if, if we make a patient's own um, heart, cardiomyocytes or other cells and we put that, that, that cell therapy back into the patient. Um, will there be an immune response to self or, or will it be tolerated? Um, we, we have to demonstrate that in vivo before we could actually put these therapies into the patient. We assume that there will be no autologous or self-response, but during the process of making iPS cells, um, there's you know, genetic manipulation, there's growing cells in, in plastic dishes and these unnatural environments, so we really we have to test it out in concept. So what we can do is we can, take, we can make a BLT mouse, which has, again, the, um, so you take the, the liver cell to get the, the CD34 hematopoietic progenitor cells, the thymus, um, you make your mice, but then you can also take 
um, excess tissue that's not needed in the process of making the mice and make iPS cells. And then you take those iPS cells and differentiate them into um, different cell types to use as a therapy. Put that back into the mouse and you have the iPS therapy interacting with immune cells from the same patient. And you can also um, do different degrees of tissue matching HLA molecules that are important for transplant um, rejection and tolerance. You can do different matching strategies and really use this model to investigate that concept. So with a traditional BLT type mouse, you can make about 15 or 20 mice with one set of, or one uh, sample of, of tissue. And um, the issue that arises is once, you're, once you've made your mice and you do your experiments, you have to move on to a, another a tissue specimen. Um, so really characterizing the donor, if you want to go through the trouble of making iPS cells, um, doing any gene correction experiments, um, using you know, CRISPR and different technologies that um, you can really um, cr correct different um, diseases that have a genetic component. And doing um, repeat experiments, it's really difficult if you only have 15, 20 mice, and then you have to move on to a, a new um, tissue set that has um, dramatically different genetic background. And this is where the, the politics um, creeps in as well. This is, this is the backdrop. This in 2015 and also other, various other times, um, both at the state level and the federal level, there's been a push to um, ban or otherwise restrict uh, human fetal tissue research. And um, that causes some uncertainty for using the, the BLT type model. And I'm happy to answer questions or, or talk more about you know, my, my opinions on this. Um, but I'll just say it's a, it's a, it's a difficult environment to, to, to work in when you're facing um, uh, politics encroaching onto the science rather than what's the best um, scientific choice. Um, so in that context, but also for, to answer different biological questions, we devised a, an alternative model to the BLT, which we call the neothi. And that's for neonatal thymus. So we're in the Department of Surgery, and we work with um, with different uh, surgeons that are you know doing saving people's lives and doing doing these surgeries. Um, there's a, a pediatric heart surgeon named Petros Anagnostopoulos at the Children's Hospital who um, corrects heart defects in children. And as I mentioned, when um, Right after birth, the thymus is very large and it's obstructing the heart. So when they go in to do their heart surgery, they have to remove all or most, if not all, of the thymus just to get at the heart and, and um, patch up the, these kids. Um, and typically that's discarded as medical waste. Um, so we thought, since we, we have collaborations with these surgeons, could we use that instead of incinerating it? Could we try and make humanized mice out of this thymus tissue? Um, one immediate advantage over the, the fetal, you know, not talking about ethics or politics, but just the amount of tissue in this case, um, almost 10 grams of, of tissue with the neonatal thymus versus a half a gram for fetal tissue. And we dissect the thymus up into these, it's just a one millimeter by one millimeter fragment. That's all you need to make one mouse. So you can make over a thousand mice um, from one tissue donor. So compared to the, the, the BLT model, here we would have the potential to make lots of mice, and that really enables in-depth characterization of the donor, making iPS cells, fully characterizing them, doing all sorts of experiments and repeating those experiments. So we we're very intrigued about trying to develop this model. And one, I just, I'll mention this briefly, we, um, through our collaborators, this, this paper came out of the Thompson Lab, and I, I, I was a co-author on this um, development. We, we call it the Badger Mouse, because it looks like a <laughs> badger. Um, it's a version of this white NSG mouse that it's immunocompetent, so you can still transplant in your tissues to do your experiments, but you don't need to irradiate it to get engraftment of human cells. So um, it's, a, it's a very easy mouse to work with. It looks like a badger, so we, we like it. And, um, so that's what we're using for all of our experiments. So the overall principle of what we proposed and were funded by um, ICTER at, at the UW and, and some other funding, um, it looks like this. It's kind of a, a busy diagram, but 
we have IRB approval to, to do all this research and um, it took about a year to coordinate getting all these, these samples and you know, working with the clinicians, getting this lined up. But basically how it goes is there's a in utero diagnosis of a uh, heart malformation where they know that surgery is going to be needed shortly after birth. Um, so at, at this point, I'll, I'll go and consent the mothers to be a part of the study, and we've had great participation um, so far. A tremendously difficult situation that the, the mothers are in. Um, when the child is born, we get umbilical cord blood as a source of hematopoietic stem cells. We can separate those and, and freeze those for later use. And then one to three weeks later, the um, baby will have a, their heart surgery, and that's when we get the thymus, and we dissect it into those fragments, and we can also freeze those. So we have frozen cells and thymus tissue that we can then make our mice with at any time in the future. So once those are banked, we'll go on to make IPS cells from, from the extra cells involved in those processes, differentiate them into the, the beating cardiomyocytes or the endothelial cells, and then we make our mice and we can transplant them back in and study the immune response. And we also do in vitro immune assays to corroborate that. So this is, I'll show some data from our, our paper, excuse me, showing the development of this model. And the, the short version is this was successful and um, we, um, I'll, I'll show you the data that, that we generated. Um, so we, we implanted our thymic fragments into the mice and injected our hematopoietic stem cells. And after 12 weeks, we opened up the mice. And this is um, the kidney. And <clears throat> we first noticed a, a pretty large difference that when you use the, the fetal tissue, the control, um, it start, both start out as a one millimeter fragment, but the fetal tissue grows tremendously and um, can even grow larger than this, uh, maybe a hundredfold expansion of the tissue in 12 weeks. But with a neonatal tissue, it maybe grew about four times the size, um, so limited, limited growth. So at that point, we weren't sure if this was going to be a functional model. Maybe the, the neonatal tissue just isn't robust enough to, to work in this model. But we did histological analysis and of this neonatal thymic fragment, and we did see all the anatomical structures um, that are required in the thymus to make T cells. So we were encouraged that this would still be enough. Maybe a little bit of tissue is still enough. And when we took blood samples, we did this is these are flow cytometry plots again, and you look at um, this is a mouse marker that will be on all all mouse cells, CD45. And this will be on all human blood cells, human CD45. And you had engraftment of the human cells in circulation, 82.3% in this example, and versus 14.5% uh, of the mouse. And then if you, you gate on these human cells, you have your B cells, CD19, as well as uh, CD3 positive T cells. And then subgating, you get both CD4s and CD8s. So, this was an important moment. We, we got human engraftment using all these, these neonatal tissues. And if you look at um, regulatory T cells, which are one of those T cell subsets that are very important for um, transplantation, they, they help blunt the immune response to um, transplanted tissues, we found um, regulatory T cells, as determined by these markers, in the blood, in the spleen, and in tissues such as the lung. Myeloid cells, which are, include antigen-presenting cells that are important um, for a robust immune response, those were pre present in the blood and other tissues. And this shows that um, just how, how these, these levels change over time. This is a plot of, of time and weeks. And then, again, this is all flow cytometry data, graphed out, percent positive. And the gray circles are that just the total human cell engraftment. It starts out at week five, pretty low, but then um, the majority of the cells in the mouse are human. Um, at first, they're CD19 B cells, very little T cells, but as they migrate to that thymic fragment, the T cells start to develop, and you get a more of a normalization of both T cells, B cells, and other immune cells. And the, the engraftment of these human cells is durable, so it can go for you know, 30 weeks or more. And that's important because what that does is it gives you a big experimental window where we can make these mice and then we have, um, could have up to four month long transplantation studies. 
So how does it compare to the, to the BLT um, fetal tissue based model? We did the side by side experiments. Um, so looking at total human engraftment in the blood, looked at CD19 B cells and CD3 T cells. And at two time points, an early time point and a later time point in the mice. And there was no significant difference um, in, in either of the, or in all three of these markers. So it, it looks like the, just the frequency of the human cells in both mice are, are similar. So the question is, are they similarly functional as, as the BLT? So when you take out the T cells from the spleen and you stimulate them through the T cell receptor, they rapidly proliferate. And this is a CFSC prol proliferation dye. When, when this shifts to the left, that means the cells are, are dividing, and so they're, they're rapidly dividing. And they're secreting these cytokines that are important for function of the T cells. So the numbers are there, and it appears that they're, they're functional. And then we did some additional tests where we did skin transplants onto the mice and showed that um, both the BLT type mouse and the neothi are able to reject a skin transplant rather robustly. Um, so then we made iPS cells, and these are some of the standard uh, characterization assays that you do for iPS cells. I won't really go into many details, but we were able to make fully functional iPS cells from these tissue donors. And then we transplant them into the mice and this is actually a picture. You'll notice that this one isn't quite as nice as that first one I showed you that was contracting and had the, the vascularization. But nonetheless, we were able to um, do this histological staining and cardiac troponin T is a marker of cardiomyocytes. So you have the kidney and then the cardiomyocyte preparation that was transplanted. And then you have infiltration of both CD4 and to a lesser extent CD8 T cells. So this was just to, to validate the model. And we've also are, are doing some work with John Odorico's lab in the Department of Surgery making um, pancreatic islet like cells and transplanting those and um, evaluating the, inf the immune infiltration in those samples too. So what we're, what we're currently doing in progress is, is recreating, optimizing the graphs to, to be more akin to what will actually be going into patients where you get this nice contraction in vivo with vascularization and transplanting those into the mice and um, evaluating the data. So I'll kind of leave it at that. Just one last thing about the, the political aspects of doing this tissue. Um, last, doing this research, last um, December, um, so this, our paper was published in March of 2018, and then in November, December, it got caught up in this political firestorm that you've probably heard about with fetal tissue in the news. Um, the, and I'm happy to answer questions or talk offline about this too, but it was a very intense December because um, this paper, so we developed this mouse that doesn't rely on fetal tissue. Um, so some groups were saying that this means we don't need any fetal tissue in, in any form. And I wanted to be careful saying that's not, that's not what we were saying. You know, it's a very specific application. We feel very strongly it has a lot of promise and there, there might be some um, biological advantages in this particular case to use the neonatal tissue. It might, it could be more representative of um, the adult immune system. Um, but without getting too much into it, um, I, I think that it, by no means did we say that we no longer need the fetal model and there's a lot more exploration and validation that we need to do compared to fetal tissue models to um, know which instances this model might be um, advantageous and which instances the fetal model might be um, more appropriate. So um, it had to give a statement to Congress to kind of ex explain um, you know, where we were coming from and trying to say more study is needed before anybody should be making conclusions about, about this model or other models. Um, with that, I'll just say thanks to, to everybody in the, you know, the Thompson Lab and the Burlingham Lab where we developed the mouse and all our collaborators that um, made this work possible, including our funding source and last but not least, my, my family for supporting me. So that is it. Thank you. Question. So I uh, type one.
one diabetes uh, questioning was the type one, it's the immune system that's gone awry, attacking, right? And in the last year or so, from your view, either firsthand or the literature, has there been um, real changes in, you know, either the, the Tregs or the attack T cells, you know, changing that um, immune system of type one diabetics so that they wouldn't reject, um, you know, transplantation? Um, I'm so I'm less familiar. Um, I, I know I, I think of it from a context that if we could make a replacement um, islet cell for these patients, that we could it, instead of having a an islet transplant, you know, making a IPS derived source. With autoimmune diseases like type one diabetes, though, you not you probably wouldn't want the autologous therapy, so you'd have to do some type of a, a banked cell. Um, but as far as as far as um, the disease itself, I um, I'm I don't think I can really comment on it. Um, John Odorico, who is our, our collaborator, that we do a lot of the, these experiments, is much more familiar with where um, where that's at. When the, you do the transplant with the cardiomyocytes, and then and then you get vascularization, is that derived from the transplanted cells? And so it's different re differentiation into vascular. Element? Well, that's a very good question. We're we're trying to figure that out. We have some indications that there may be a a progenitor within that population that also has endothelial potential. There are, there is literature that. Um, the recipients can revascularize different types of transplants, but um, we have we have done some staining. We're trying to validate it to, to say definitively, but there are some indications that it's it's part of that 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 cell therapy itself that we're we're delivering. It's we we try and define what we're what makes up the therapy. It's ninety plus percent cardiomyocytes, but there are some um, additional cells that are in there that might have more potential to go and um, make some of these more supportive cell types. I wonder if you use uh, three-dimensional Petri dishes to eliminate some dependent variables and, and how that would compare with your mouse model. Uh, oh, you mean just totally instead of using the, the mouse at all, this, like an organoid type of a... Yeah, um, yeah I mean, the, and that's... Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of promising things you can do and you, you can you know make different organs on a chip or make um, organize and try and rec recreate that without even um, having to use the mouse model um, um, I'll just say I think that's a promising approach too there there's there's pros and cons to each I think the using a an actual living mouse model ha has um, more of that orchestrated um, you know, biological system that could be very difficult to recreate that um, totally in a um, total in vitro uh, setting. But um, I think there's definitely a place for organoids, and I, I know that that's developing um, uh, as well. There's some promising developments there. I got lost a bit when you were talking about making our mouse. I, I oh. didn't know. Could you clarify that big picture? Yeah, just how they're made, the, how you make a humanized mouse, or is well, that? I, I didn't know what you meant, making a mouse, making our mouse. Okay, yeah, I'll, just, I'll go back to this, um, kind of the overview of, <clears throat> so there, there's a lot, of, a lot of different parts here. Um, so I, I'd say there's, there's three main components into creation of a humanized mouse. You have the mouse itself, um, and this, this one is called the NSG, and that's a, it's a particular, it's a genetically manipulated um, inbred uh, mouse strain that has been developed over, over the years of optimization. So you, ha you have this mouse that cannot make T cells, it cannot make B cells, or, or other immune cells of its own. Um, so it's very permissive to being transplanted with, with human cells, with other mouse cells, because it's got no way to reject them. So we, we take the mouse strain, and then we're transplanting in uh, the, the human cells to encourage the development of, of the human immune system. And 
the, the two key components to creation of a T cell or in these other cells is, is these CD34 hematopoietic stem cells, which are like um, bone marrow transplants that people get for um, uh, cancer treatments and other therapies where you take these, these CD34 hematopoietic stem cells and they have the potential to make any blood cells. They make red blood cells, platelets, and then all the cells of your immune system. So we, we isolate those, and um, in the human fetus, they're, they're located in the liver, and they gradually, during development, go, they, they're located in the bone marrow. But at this time point, you, you get them from, from the liver. So that's your source of, of cells that will go on to become T cells, B cells, and everything else. <clears throat> and then in order to get truly functional T cells, you need those developing cells to interact with those thymic um, uh, structures and, and molecules that are very important for, for T cell development. So we're, we're putting this all in one where the hematopoietic stem cells and the thymus um, are, the, are the, the, like the seeds to grow the, the T cells and other cells and then the, the mouse is the permissive garden where all this can happen and it's a in vivo environment too. To have that happen, does that help a little bit? Or? Okay. Any other questions? In your study, for example, when a conventional heart transplant is done, mm -hmm. they say the life expectancy is about ten years after a heart transplant or eight years. Some kind of a prediction can be made with type of with this type of study that should we have a transplant if it's successful based on this? Whether you need repetitive transplants or once you do it, that the patient will survive for so many years. Um, it's a good question. And, and as of right now, we're still at a, a very early stage. Um, so I believe there's one. Uh, clinical trial in Europe using cardiomyocytes from pluripotent stem cells and what they're doing is actually just making a patch and then they'll seed it with, with, with cardiomyocytes and I think some progenitor cells and they'll, they'll actually place it on the heart and, and the idea is to um, improve um, and I, I, I'm not an expert on this so I, I won't go too far but more for repairing an infarct or a damaged area of a heart rather than totally replacing it like might be needed in a, a traditional organ transplant. But someday it would be great to just recreate a whole three-dimensional organ made from, from IPS cells, you know, have some type of a scaffold and then make pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes and other supporting cells. Um, much more complicated to do that and um, but people are actively working on that, trying to you know, make a, make a scaffold that cells can be seeded upon and then um, trying to differentiate all those different cell types that are in the, in the heart. But for now, it's going to be um, the, first, the first iteration of these therapies will be patches to try and encourage repair of a, of a damaged part of the heart. <coughs> That's a very good question too. Um, so um, the good news is uh, the immune system is developing all throughout gestation. So at the time of birth, um, they, they do already have a component of, of T cells. Um, when it's removed, it most likely does diminish to some degree the, the amount of new T cells that can be made. You can have extra thymic T cell development but um, uh, there's been various studies, and um, it's, it's hard to say exactly, but usually these patients are, are very sick kids that have to go through multiple surgeries and eventually a transplant. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult situation, and I think while they, they might have some degree of immune, um, be immune compromised, they, they do have some degree of, of immune system. And um, yeah, but they are very sick patients, unfortunately. Tom? Can you tell us more about your business model for running the facility and uh, how you get that up and running, what the expectations are for your 
in common outgo and all that good stuff? For the, the, the humanized mouse core? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on that, and I... Um, yeah, so uh, for, I think since 2012, um, Dr. Burlingham, uh, Will Burlingham, who's, who I did my graduate work with, has had the, this humanized mouse core, and I'm, I'm working with him to, to kind of have version 2.0 to um, hopefully bring this uh, neothi model and other models to researchers on campus and also outside of the university. So it's, a, it's an ongoing process that... Um, um, it's a work in progress, and but the the gist is we we do both um, collaborations with other investigators on campus, and also some fee for service work, where um, if people need certain types of there there's other types of humanized mice besides the BLT and the neothi, so we make a variety of different humanized mice for investigators, um, and sometimes just as a fee for service, sometimes in in collaboration. Um, but this is something that um, it's kind of an, it's an ongoing project that we'll be hopefully launching as a humanized mouse core 2.0 sometime at, uh, early next year, I would say. And is that going to be housed at Wimmer, or where is that? Um, we're, still, we're still finalizing that. It, um, as of right now, we're, we're, um, we have some mice at Wimmer, but we, we're doing our breeding and a lot of our humanizations at, at the MSC facility, actually, the um, uh, Jody Peters um, Breeding Corps. They have a dedicated room where um, it's very sensitive surgery, and these mice can get sick very easily if, the, if um, everything isn't, isn't perfect with you know, controlling pathogens. So we we're, we have a dedicated room that you know only we can have access to, and then we ship our mice out to other investigators at Wimmer and, and elsewhere. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you're familiar with the University of Wisconsin WebPack. It's an electric motor drive consortium where companies uh, pay pay money for research because it sounds like your mouse model, other industry partners might be interested in that and. and to start a consortium like Wimpec. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. I should, uh, I'll, I'll definitely look into that. It's Win Winpec, it's called? It's called Winpec, yeah. Okay. So, um, the Wisconsin Electric Motor Consortium? Yeah. So when you go look it up, it's W-E, it's not W-I, it's W-E-M-P-A-C. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely, um, it, and it gets, it gets tricky with, uh, you know, there, there's a, uh, the predominant model is the is the BLT mouse, and a lot of um, there's a lot of interest, but it's also controversial. And certain biotechs um, don't want to be involved with fetal tissue, and um, so I think these types of models have a lot of promise. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much.